okay so yesterday we saw that in general you can model the output of an inverter at least right the power being consumed over there if the load capacitance is cl then effectively on every 0 to 1 transition there will be a energy of half cv square that is being dissipated in the system and on a 1 to 0 transition there will be another half cv square right we came at, came to this conclusion under a couple of assumptions one is during the transition 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 the entire current that is flowing from the source is essentially flowing into the capacitance in order to charge it right And the second assumption is that uh, the load capacitance includes all the parasitics that are present at that output terminal. Okay. So, in other words, when I am talking about this point over here, there will also be some parasitic capacitance due to the inverter itself. There will also be some capacitance due to the wire that is connected to it and finally there will be the capacitance of whatever this inverter is driving okay so we are sort of lumping all of those together into one cl value and saying okay this is the amount of capacitance that needs to be switched okay what do we mean by switched it has to change from having a voltage of zero across it to a voltage of vdd or vice versa okay so of course in practice what happens is a part of the current that is being drawn from the source will go directly to ground as a short circuit current. We already looked at that yesterday. right? But we can sort of treat them independently. We essentially say if I consider only the part which is going into the CL, this is the energy contributed by that. If I consider the part directly going to ground, there is a separate amount of energy that is just dissipated as short circuit power. Okay? So finally what we can combine all of those together and say that the energy per transition is half cv square right what is the rate at which transitions take place two times the frequency at which we have a 0 to 1 transition right so why am i writing it this way essentially a 0 to 1 transition has to be followed by 1 to 0 before the next 0 to 1 can take place right so the total number of transitions is going to be twice the number of 0 to 1 transitions which is why i am writing it as 2f 0 to 1 okay and f 0 to 1 this essentially corresponds to full cycles of the system So one complete cycle, 0 to 1 and then back to 0 is considered the is what is being accounted for by that F02. Okay. So finally what we have is that the power dissipation, which is the energy dissipated per unit time, is going to be given by C V square into F 0 to 1. Okay. Now this is the case for and of course we did this analysis for the case of an inverter. We still do not know what an AND gate or an OR gate or an XOR gate is going to look like. But the point I am trying to convey over here is you look at this analysis it does not matter. right? Because at the end of the day we can sort of anticipate that the way that we are going to construct any other kind of gate is also in some kind of similar structure right there will be some uh, pmos and some nmos transistors the pmos transistors will be responsible for delivering current into the load the nmos transistors will be responsible for discharging okay that's all that we really in, in needed to know in order to derive this equation which means that in general supposing i have some arbitrary gate right driving a load capacitance 
right? Where when I mark CL, I have also accounted for the parasitic, the wire capacitance, etc. Then what I can essentially say is that the power dissipated here is going to be given by CL VDD square into F, whatever, I will call this node I, right? Fi, the rate at which that particular node is switching from 0 to 1 and back. Right? Which means, yeah. That is the total number of transitions. So, this total number of transitions is 2 times, what I mean by a transition is either 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. Yes. So, F 0 to 1 is a full cycle which consists of two transitions, 1 0 to 1 followed by 1 to 0, right. On each transition the energy dissipated is half C V square. So, in one full cycle the energy dissipated is C V square. So, C V square multiplied by the number of full cycles will give you the power, ok. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, I am defining F 0 to 1 as the number of 0 to 1 transitions per second, the frequency of 0 to 1 transitions, right. So, F 0 to 1 is just the number of 0 to 1 transitions per second. Now, every 0 to 1 transition has to be followed by 1 to 0, otherwise I cannot again go from 0 to 1. Therefore, the total number of transitions is going to be twice F 0 to 1, okay. All right. So, what happens if we have a more complex circuit, right? What I will have in a larger circuit is essentially some kind of set of gates that are connected together in various ways. right, some arbitrary circuit of this sort, okay. <coughs> so, what I can effectively do in order to compute the power dissipated in this circuit is to say, all right, let me take every output node, right. So, what are the output nodes? This is one, this is another one, this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one, right. The output of every gate, I look at that, I look at the total capacitance that is present at each of those terminals. Right, I will call this C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. All right. So, this is the total capacitance. Why am I interested in the total capacitance? Because that is the amount of work that needs to be done at each of those terminals. That much opposition to change in voltage is present. Right? That is what capacitance is defined as. It is an opposition to the change in voltage. Right? All of that capacitance has to get charged from 0 to 1, 1 to 0 depending on what the transition is. Okay? Now, over here as I can see I have 6 output nodes, ok. One of the gates has 2 outputs that could happen for example if it is a half, a half adder or full adder, right. All the other gates pretty much have only single outputs, typical NAND gate, NOR gate, XOR gate type of stuff, right. But the point is it does not matter, I am interested only in what is happening at the switching of each output, ok. So, what this means is, I mean C 1 by the way, I have drawn it sort of you know going to, I have drawn the capacitance looking upwards, I am actually interested only in the capacitances to ground, ok. So, even though I have drawn it upwards, that actually is supposed to be ground, ok. It is not that that one is alone special and connected to VDD or something. The point is it is connected to a fixed voltage, it is connected to an incremental ground, that is all that matters, right. So, now when I look at a circuit like this. What can I say about the frequency of transitions? 
how often are these terminals going to switch? Each one would have a different switching frequency, right? There is no reason why they should all be the same. Okay? So, in general, I can associate a frequency with this one, let us say F1. So, F1 is the frequency at which that node 1 switches. What do I mean by that? It means how many complete cycles does node 1 go through in a given amount of time. Complete cycles 0 to 1 followed by back to 0. Okay. Similarly, there will be F2 over here, F3 here, F4, F5, F6. Right? They need not be the same because, I mean, that's obvious. Not all the gates in a circuit are going to switch at the same time. Right? As far as an inverter is concerned, whenever its input changes, the output will also change. So, that is straightforward. But let us consider a NAND gate. If one of the inputs is just changing from, you know, if one of the inputs is fixed at 0 and the other input changes, the output is not going to change. Okay. So, it is definitely possible that the rate at which the output switches is different from what the rate at which the input switches. Okay. So, I collapse all that together. I am not telling you how to arrive at these numbers F1, F2 and so on. All I am saying is using let us say simulations or using some other mechanism, right? you may be able to estimate those F values F1, F2 up to, up to F6. Right? In which case the total power dissipated by this circuit is just add all the contributions together. Okay? So, the total power is going to be this C i the individual capacitance V d d square into F i. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. 0 to 1 prob the 0 to 1 switching frequency of the ith output. Okay. Going back to this diagram here, right? What I am considering as a 0 to 1 transition is this is one, this is the other, right? In the middle, there is another 1 to 0 transition, and after that, there is another 1 to 0 transition here. So, these are 0 to 1, whereas these two are 1 to 0, right? I do not want to count them separately. What I am saying is every time there is a 0 to 1 transition that has to be followed by a 1 to 0 transition before the next 0 to 1 transition can take place. right? Because only if I come back to 0, I can then again go to 1. Okay. So, when I count F 0 to 1, I count full cycles. right? I am going 0 to 1 followed by 1 to 0, so I am counting that. On each of those transitions, half CV square is dissipated. Right? So, half Cv square plus half Cv square, Cv square is dissipated over one complete 0 to 1 transition, that is all. Right? So, in this case what happens is the F1, F2, F3, etc. are the switching frequencies at each of those outputs. Right? I can add up the individual power dissipation. C i V d d square F i is the contribution at the i th node that does not interfere with any of the other power dissipation. So, I just add up the individual contributions come up with sigma over i C i V d d square F i. Okay. Now, what is done in practice is very often people say I do not want to be dealing with this F i term. I do not want to sort of have to go and measure F i at each node. right? So, let me see if I can sort of abstract that, that out into another term. It still does not solve my problem. I still need to find out how to get that other term, but in terms of writing the expression, I can slightly simplify it. Okay? What I am going to say is F i is equal to some alpha i 
times f where f is the system clock frequency right now this f is a well known constant for a given circuit right so supposing i say that you know i have the latest intel processor in my uh, computer 3 gigahertz operating speed 3 gigahertz is f okay that's my operating frequency for the entire circuit the important point is the circuit is getting a clock of 3 gigahertz but if i go look at any one gate inside that circuit and look at its output in general it will not be switching at 1 uh, 3 gigahertz okay it will be switching at some rate alpha i where alpha is between 0 to 1 when will alpha can you think of a signal for which alpha is going to be equal to 1 the clock okay right? so the clock in a circuit is pretty much the only signal for which alpha will be actually equal to 1 right what does that mean it means that on every transition of the clock there is a transition of the clock so it's a tautology over there, right but very unlikely that there will be other circuits other signals actual logic signals for which alpha is equal to 1 okay now how do i really solve the problem here no all that i have done is said that instead of calculating fi i'll calculate alpha I. how do i do that i still don't have a solution pretty much the only way of doing it is you run large scale simulations of the system logic simulations right not spice simulations so that's the big advantage over here i can run logic simulations instead of spice simulations what's a logic simulation it's just saying If I apply this zero, one, etc. to these gates, what will the output be? Okay, and propagating that through the entire circuit. That can be done much, much, much faster than a spice simulation. Orders of magnitude faster. Okay, but still is pretty slow for large circuits. Okay, but if I can do that kind of a logic simulation, at least I can use that information in order to extract this alpha i. information equivalently fi it's the same thing it's just that it's a different way of writing okay so if i can write this then effectively what i have is p is equal to vdd square into f into sigma alpha i ci okay and usually what is done is very often people will go one step further and say i will take the total capacitance in my circuit what is the total capacitance just add up the individual capacitances of every the output of every gate okay multiply by the corresponding alpha is right and then finally divided by the sum of sigma ci okay and i will replace this by some alpha times c where c is equal to sigma ci okay this alpha is sort of an average switching activity across the entire circuit it is something that you have just calculated as an average across the entire circuit okay how do you get this number simulation is one way there are some probability based methods which sort of try and estimate the rate at which some nets are going to switch but ultimately it's an empirical value it is something which depends on the circuit depends on the kind of inputs that are given to it right and the only way of getting it is pretty much by running through an exhaustive simulation okay so finally what we will be able to write is P is equal to alpha c v d square f, right? Where f is the system clock frequency, v d d of course is the supply voltage, c is the total capacitance of all nodes in the circuit, and alpha is something which depends on the circuit, right? It is not an absolute empirical constant, right? It is actually something which depends on the circuit. It depends on the type of inputs that are given to the circuit. 
okay the important point about this is typically for a given circuit let's say a processor or a, you know a error correcting code or a serial line decoder or an ethernet chip for any given circuit that you are designing once you estimate alpha typically you can say that for most of the workloads that the system is going to see that alpha is going to remain the same not necessarily but on average it does okay what that means is i can spend some time right at the beginning sort of estimating what the alpha would be for a given circuit thereafter i know that any such similar circuit that i design is just going to have alpha cv square f where i just need to calculate the total c i already know vdd and f so i can get an estimate of the power that will be dissipated by the circuit this is not very accurate but is very very useful in terms of an early estimate of how much power the circuit is going to consume plus it will also give you guidelines on where to reduce power okay given this much information if i asked you to reduce the power consumption in a circuit what would you do pretty much so you can ha huh? no that's what i'm saying it it is not an absolute constant it will depend on the inputs in fact if i change the circuit slightly it will change but for large enough for over over measure over measured over a long enough time you can sort of say that okay it is going to be reasonably constant in practice of course it absolutely does depend on the inputs right the simple case is when a processor is asleep or going into a sleep mode right there is no activity on the address bus or data bus which means there will be no activity inside the processor right so i can't say that the alpha should still be some value over here what i'm saying is over the lifetime of the processor over a long duration if you average it out then it will come out reasonably close to a constant it will sort of converge to this so you can use that as an estimate that's all okay now typical value of alpha for many circuits right have been observed to be less than 0.1 okay why am i throwing out this number over here just to sort of give you an idea it's not a number that you can sort of use this is just to sort of give you an idea of the scale of the values that we are talking about right what does that mean then alpha is less than 0.1 it means that on average a given gate in a circuit somewhere is switching only 1/10 of the time that it could have been switching right 90% of the time it is at a constant value 10% of the time it is switching okay so if you look at it in some sense what it's telling you is you have designed this large circuit gate uh, you know with a large yeah large circuit with like millions of gates 90% of the time those gates are not changing their value at all 10% of the time they are changing okay so that's an interesting thing to keep in mind what it means is that when you design large circuits very often you have a relatively low switching activity it could be even less than 0.1 in most parts of the circuit okay now given this if i asked you to reduce the power consumption what are the things that you can try to do given an equation like this if i asked you to reduce power consumption what would you do ha huh? vdd seems like a very good bet right so what are the ways of reduce power uh, reducing power consumption reduce vdd okay in fact this is one of the best ways of reducing power why because it has a quadratic effect on the power right vdd squared what's the problem ha huh? noise margin will go down the current that the transistor can deliver will go down which means what the speed will go down right because the it will need more time to charge the output capacitance right so the operating frequency if i need to operate at 1 gigahertz i may not be able to reduce voltage beyond a point right so vdd and f are inversely related right if the vdd goes down the maximum f at which i can work also goes down or rather vdd and t are inversely related vdd and f are directly related right 
So what this means is two things, noise margins reduce maximum frequency of operation also reduces. So this could be a problem, right? If I wanted to operate a processor at 3 gigahertz, it's been characterized to run at 3 gigahertz under some operating voltage, maybe 1.2 volts or so. If I just reduce that voltage to 1 volt, it will no longer run at 3 gigahertz because it, the transistors cannot deliver enough current to charge the output stages to the level that is needed. Okay. So, if you have margin over there, that is you can run at a slightly lower frequency, then well and good, right? You can actually reduce VDD. What is the other alternative? F. If I can reduce F, great, that is in fact a double benefit because I have reduced the operating frequency that reduces power. Because of that, I can also reduce my voltage. Right? So, I could potentially get a S cube benefit if I go down by a factor of S in frequency, then I can sort of say that maybe the VDD also could scale down by a factor of S, not exactly, but something of that sort. Right? So, a reduction in frequency could give me great benefits. What is the problem? Why are you operating at a high frequency? Because you want to get things done fast. If I did not need to run things so fast, then I should not be running at that frequency. That is all that this is. Okay? But this latest mobile phone process, we see one processor at 1.2 gigahertz, another one at 1.8 gigahertz, we say 1.8 is better. Why? Because we feel that it will react faster when we are trying to use the phone. Right? So that will make a difference. So in fact, if you look at your phones, you will find that there are many sort of power saving modes on that. Right? Most of the power saving nodes, what do they do? They reduce the frequency, operating frequency. What they say is, at this time, I do not need to operate at 1.8 gigahertz. Running at 1 gigahertz or 600 megahertz is good enough to do whatever you are doing. Maybe all that you are doing is looking at the time. right? So, there is really nothing that needs to be done by the processor. Operate at a lower frequency. Bring down the power consumption. Right? So, that kind of frequency scaling is commonly used in all kinds of circuits, right. The thing is, if you can do it, great, nothing like it, that is probably the best way to reduce power. But in most cases, the reason why you are operating at a certain frequency, so for example, if I take an Ethernet chip, right, Ethernet is designed to work at 100 Mbps or 1 gigabit per second, right. It is no use saying that I will just reduce the clock <coughs> frequency there, then it is no longer Ethernet, it is not going to communicate with the next chip it has to operate at whatever frequency that chip was designed for, so that it can convey the information across to the other side, right. So if this can be reduced, well the problem with F, reducing F is simply that need to meet functional requirements, right, performance requirements. No, no, no. F over here is a system clock frequency. But the rate is the same even if it's in No. Now look at a circuit, right? How do I decide when it is going to transition? That depends on its inputs transitioning. Okay? If, if an input has changed from 0 to 1, the output may or may not change from 0 to 1. Based on that, I have done a simulation and found out this is the number of times that this will transition. I said per unit time, but actually it means per unit per clock cycle. Okay. So now what happens? All that I have done is I have said that I will apply my first inputs at this time, the second input let us say 10 nanoseconds later, the third input 10 nanoseconds later, fourth input 10 nanoseconds later and so on. Based on that I have come up with a certain number of transitions per second. Now I change that and say instead of 10 nanoseconds I will apply 20 nanoseconds later, 20 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds and so on. The transitions remain exactly the same, functionality has not changed in any way. This alpha has already abstracted that out. It is talking about the number of transitions of a given output relative to the number of transitions of the clock. 
okay so if the clock transitions f times per second a given output will transition alpha times f times per second so that alpha remains constant independent of f so that's actually a good point we brought up the alpha is now independent of f okay which brings us to the next thing alpha is independent of f can i reduce alpha in any way not clear how you will do this right this requires a functional change to the circuit right because the only way that i can prevent so one thing that i can do for example is if i have an xor gate somewhere can i replace it with something like a nand gate the switching probability of a nand gate may be slightly lower than for an xor gate right why because nand gate has three conditions under three input combinations under which the output is fixed one for which it transitions right there is a xor gate for every transition on an input you are likely to see a transition you will see a transition on the output okay so certain kinds of gates in that way are not very good for switching the others are better but it's not very clear at all whether you can do something like this right that requires actual functional changes to the circuit okay but if you can figure out a way to reduce alpha the switching activity yes it will help you to save power and if you look at the literature you will find that for example there are certain work on bus encoding schemes where they try to reduce the number of transitions on a data bus or address bus right similarly some other kinds of data encoding schemes which basically say okay if i use this kind of data the number of transitions is going to be less okay so this requires functional modifications to the circuit finally can c be reduced <coughs> the first two vdd and f can be reduced no questions about that the problem is what happens when you reduce them, right for the others alpha and c it's not even clear how you reduce them because you can't reduce them without changing the circuits significantly how can you reduce c right one possibility is you try to change the type of gates that's more complicated that's a functional difference the other one is you reduce the size of the value of transistors right the most common way in which that happens is when i go from one technology to the next generation okay so reduce transistor sizes let's say i have designed something at 180 nanometer technology right all the gates everything has been designed perfectly done now i decide to go to 130 nanometer if i take my entire circuit and scale it down all my capacitances everything should come down okay c has reduced power will reduce in addition to that you will find that vdd also can be reduced but that's a secondary effect right the first thing is c reduces because the overall area itself reduces right so change in capacitance is also a, definitely a significant way by which you can reduce power consumption okay all right one last thing regarding power there are two terms which you will sometimes come across which are the power delay product and the energy delay product right now why are these numbers defined and why are they considered useful the main idea over here is let's say i have two circuits same functionality right but one of them has a propagation delay of t1 the other one has t2 this one has a total power consumption of t1 this one has t2 okay how do i sort of compare them in some sense right i want to sort of say which one is better right now first cut i might say the one which consumes lower power is better 
right? Because that's sort of what we would like to see. We don't want to unnecessarily waste power. The problem is it might be consuming lower power but operating at a much slower clock. So the T2 might be much higher. So even though T2 is less, it might be that T2 is very small or very large, right? The time period required for it is very large. Now that's not good. It means that I will not get my work done in time. Right? Conversely, there might be another processor which works very fast, 3 gigahertz, whatever it is, right? But finishes your work very quickly. Okay? What can you do with such a processor? You let it work at full speed, finish the work and then go to sleep. Over a long duration, this will actually do better than the one which is slow but keeps on consuming power. Okay? So because of that, it's not entirely clear which one is better. You can't just look at it and say lower power, better circuit. Right? So because of that, one of the metrics that people define is something called the power delay product. Right? And this is used as a comparison metric between the two circuits. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's just sort of saying, you know, I multiply these two things. It's giving weightage to both of them. Just lower power alone will not be good enough. You also need to have a reasonably low delay. Okay? Why am I just multiplying them? Why am I not scaling them by some factors and adding them? You could do any of that. You could do a lot of other things as well. But power delay product is one simple to calculate metric. Okay? Now, one of the things which becomes useful over here is, if we look at power, right? P is alpha CV square F and F is inversely proportional to T. Right? The propagation delay through a gate. What this means is power delay product will become or rather to be more precise what you could say is one way of estimating it is to say that F is in fact 1 over 2t. Why 2t? Because it requires a t is the time for one transition then plus t for another transition that is the maximum possible effort which the circuit can work. Okay? Which t is this? Is this the output propagation delay of a inverter or a NAND gate or what is it? It is just the sort of nominal average propagation delay across the circuit or the maximum. Huh? Yes, it is the clock, but what I am saying is that it is, how do you decide the clock frequency? How do you decide the rate at which the clock can switch? That is determined by the rate at which the internal elements inside the circuit can switch. What is the maximum frequency at which a clock can work in other words? Right? So this I am sort of anticipating things here, we will cover this in a little bit more detail when we get the timing analysis. Right? But the important point that hopefully you can already uh, understand based on the digital systems course that you must have done in the past is at what rate can I run a clock for a given circuit that is determined by a so called critical path inside the circuit right something which starts at a register goes through some logic and ends at a register ok so if I have such a critical path through a circuit the delay through the critical path is basically the sum of the delays through some gates ok so the faster that those individual gates operate the shorter that critical path and therefore the higher the maximum frequency at which the circuit can operate. Okay? So F can be roughly considered as 1 over 2 times T where T is that maximum critical path or rather yeah, where T is the maximum delay through a given gate. Okay? In which case what we will get is assuming alpha is or rather ignoring alpha for now. Now, do not worry about the CB square by 2, that is just in order to do the computation, we have got that, right? If you want to bring alpha into the picture, that is also okay. The important point is this is now independent of frequency. The power delay product is basically a function of the capacitance of the circuit and the voltage at which it is being operated, okay? 
so when you want to compare two different circuits that perform the same function this is this can be a useful metric okay we can take this further and basically take it to the energy delay product where it will essentially be given by power into time right which means that the edp is basically going to end up once you do the calculations it should become something like cv square by 2 into t okay so now what happens is a circuit which can run at lower values of t in some sense right should give you a better energy delay product so in other words if you can run fast even if it consumes relatively higher power right that gives you a better energy delay product okay now having said all of this and talked about you know the way that you can use this to compare across circuits and so on these are not hard and fast rules you cannot just compute the power delay product of a circuit compare it with another one and say this is better right it is just something which at a very high level as a designer you may be able to use in order to compare two circuits and decide which one to go with but if you make all your decisions based on this you are almost certainly going to go wrong at some point because this is a very crude approximation okay it is useful but it is also necessarily crude the way it is defined okay all right so with that we come to the end of the power related discussions okay i am going to continue now i mean as far as the quiz is concerned pretty much i think uh, the second assignment by the way that was uploaded has some of this the power delay product and so on the quiz will have something up to power okay but primarily on whatever was covered before that in the class in the in the two tutorials okay but something related to power is also likely to be there right uh, if you have any questions if you have any doubts that need to be clarified please let me know as soon as possible we can have friday as a date for essentially clearing those uh, questions okay it will not be a tutorial session unless i requ get specific requests for that okay so far i have not but if you do have any doubts please send them to me directly and we can discuss those in class before proceeding with the rest of it. okay all right so with that i'm going to sort of move on to the next topic i'm going to start on it now this particular portion will not be there on the quiz but it's simple enough that you know you don't need to worry about studying it separately right what we are talking about is how do we implement more complex gates what do i mean by a complex gate right an example is a nand gate right so what is a nand gate it has this is usually the schematic used to indicate a nand gate it has two inputs which we call a and b and one output y it is defined in terms of a truth table if a and b are 0 0 the output y is what is the value of the output 1 0 1 1 1 0 also 1 and for 1 1 the output is 0 okay now what we are interested in is how do we go about implementing a nand gate using the same kind of cmos process that we have been discussing so far for the inverter okay so what is the c in cmos it's complementary mos right why complementary because you use both a p mos and an n mos in order to realize a given circuit so in the same manner how do i get the functionality corresponding to a nand gate that's my question okay so the simplest way to sort of think about it is let's start from the output what are the roles played by the respective p mos and n mos which one is responsible for pulling the output up to 1 the p mos and which one is responsible for pulling it down to 0 the n mos okay so they are effectively playing complementary roles over there right one of them is responsible for the pull down the other one is responsible for pull up okay so in fact any circuit can be sort of thought of in terms of 
two different segments. There is a pull up network and a pull down network. Okay, and designing any sort of combinational logic function in this way is a question of getting the correct pull up and pull down networks. Okay. So let us start with a pull down network because it is a little easier to understand at first glance. Right? I want the output y to be 0 when both a and b are 1. What kind of connection should I use for the NMOS transistors? Put them in series, right? so that only when both of them are turned on will they form a conducting path to ground and the output will get pulled down to 0. So this much is clear. During this time, I can safely assume that the entire pull up network is completely out of the picture. I need to make sure that that is the case, right? I have to be careful about how I connect my PMOS transistors and make sure that while the NMOS are on, the PMOS are completely disconnected. They are cut off. That, that part of the circuit is cut off, right? Otherwise, what will end up happening is Y will be neither VDD nor 0. It will be somewhere in between because there will be a PMOS and an NMOS pulling in opposite directions. I do not want that. So what I do instead is, now let us look at the pull up network. Under what conditions should the output be pulled up? If either A is 0 or B is 0 or both are 0. Okay. So A is 0, a 0 at an input is good for turning on a PMOS because the source terminal is connected to VDD. If I connect the, grain, uh, the gate to ground, I get a VGS of VDD, which effectively turns on that transistor, right? So it looks as though I need to connect them in parallel now. Right? This is what the pull-up network looks like. What does it do? If A is 0, the output will get pulled up to VDD. If B is 0, also the output will get pulled up to VDD. If both are 0, also the output gets pulled up to VDD. Right? If both are 1, what happens? Both of these PMOS transistors are off, but we know that under that condition, the pull, pull down network takes over and pulls the output down to ground. Okay? All right, so this is how we would create the pull up and pull down networks for a simple gate, a MAND gate. Next thing that we need to see is how do we generalize this to other kinds of gates and how do we choose the sizes of the transistors that go into these gates. All right, we stop here. <laughs>